Life interview. Today I'm going to interview Lisa from Raw Food Romance and we are going to talk about a very interesting subject. We are going to talk about self-discipline. And um, I think that it's really important that we bring some, you know, some some common sense to this subject because, of course, this subject can be very helpful, but sometimes it can also be controversial because if self-discipline is not applied, you know, just in a reasonable way, it can actually um, it can actually cause us harming ourselves. And this is something which I believe happens oftentimes in the raw vegan movement. And I think that Lisa is somebody who has really uh, many years of experience with self-discipline and it's her favorite subject. So I'm really excited to, to talk about this subject with her today. So let's see, uh, let's see um, if Lisa is there. We have to wait a little bit. Sometimes it takes a while before she can see that I'm actually uh, live. So let's just wait until she connects. Um, yeah, so I really think that we can bring some common uh, common sense uh, after this discussion today, and I'm really in- excited to to hear from her about the book that uh, she has been reading recently. Um, I don't know who the author is actually, but I just uh, noticed it in her stories that she was sharing some uh, f- some uh, sentences from the book. So I'm just really really uh, curious what she has to say about. Um, about her experience with uh, self-discipline. And in addition, you know, uh, before I went live today, I also realized that the Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle just wouldn't be basically possible if it was not for self-discipline, because, you know, managing uh, 33 people who contributed to to this uh, Raw Vegan Bundle um, just wouldn't be possible if uh, we didn't have self-discipline. So I see that Lisa is there. So... Let's just see if she is going to, yes. Hello. Hello, hello, how are you? to see you, Lisa. It's really nice. It just feels like it's been too long, you know? I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's always too long. Yeah. We're always so busy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, tell me about it. Four kids and they are just in their teenage years now. So, you know, I thought that life will become easier. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be that way. But um, today we are going to talk about interesting subject. And I think that, you know, this subject is so cool because it can be basically applied uh, to any aspect of our life. And uh, I noticed on your Instagram uh, profile and especially in your stories that you have been reading really, really interesting book. So, you know, I would like to uh, basically start this discussion, not even talking about this book, but I would like to start at the beginning. You know, like when was it that you started to be curious about self-discipline? So I, I'm kind of like thinking, you know, the first 10 years on your raw vegan journey, did you apply any self-discipline or did it start after the first years of the 10 years of trying and, you know, like failing or did you really, did you start to apply it later? Like when you finally started to find the flow and succeeded on the, on the raw vegan lifestyle. So I just really would like to bo- go back to where it all started. Mm, that's a really good question. And as you're asking it, I'm like, did I use some of the principles? And so the book that I'm reading is called Mindful Self-Discipline by Giovanni Deinsman. And it's probably one of my favorite books that I've ever read, (laughs) really, one of the top ones. Um, And I I read it first probably about four years ago, three three years ago or so. So, And I'm really- This is your your second time that you are reading it? Yeah, yeah, this is the second time. And, And I find like, you know, reading it a second time, I'm getting even more out of it. So I will probably read it again in a couple years. But in the first 10 years of raw, well, I mean, I've been raw now t- almost 10 years, it'll be 10 years in September. But I would say like the first couple years raw, I, I did apply some of the principles without really realizing mm-hmm. that I was right, like they just came intuitively to me. 
And one of the big things was focusing on who I wanted to become. And that's something that I'm learning a lot, relearning again and again, as we all are mm -hmm. in this book is learning, like connecting with your future self, because a lot of us don't connect with our future self. It's almost like it's somebody else. And I read a really interesting um, page in the book and he talks about how when people are studied to like procrastinate their things onto their future self, they assume that their future self is going to be able to do it. Right. They're like, Oh yeah, I'm totally going to do that later. Uh, you know, like we think that our future self will be able to do it, but when it comes time to do it, we put it off again, because if we can't do it today, what makes us think we're going to do it tomorrow? Right. <laughs> so we keep putting it off and we assume that we can do it. But it's like, well, we got to do it now <laughs> so that we can do it. But what I was realizing was that I needed to think of my future self because my future self would soon be my present self. And if I didn't think of my future self, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't <laughs> be here doing the things that I'm doing. And like I said, we're always growing. We're always improving, you know, until the end of our life. We're always going to be working on something. But to recognize where I was and where I wanted to be and who was the person that I wanted to be. I wanted to be a raw vegan and I wanted to eat healthy and I wanted to go to bed early and I wanted to do these things. Mm -hmm. And we want to do these things. We want it, right? Because, you know, when you say, when someone says like, I want to go to bed early tonight, it's a want. It means that they want to do that. But there's also other wants that we have, like staying up late or eating whatever. Like we have all these wants. And what self-discipline asks for, it doesn't ask for you to do things that you don't want to do, right? You know, and some people be like, well, I don't want to go to bed late, early tonight, right? Well, then you don't want to, right? But you do want to if it's something that you want. So it doesn't ask you what you to do what you don't want to do it asks you to do what you do want to do so if you maybe do you don't want to maybe you don't want to go to bed early but you do want to wake up fresh in the morning right exactly so it's really about picking which want you want the most right instead of feeling guilty that you want to stay up late instead of feeling resentful or ashamed of yourself for wanting to eat pizza or cookies or whatever it is instead of feeling that way just accept it with a neutral feeling like be like ah i see that i have this desire right and what are my other options i also desire a salad and i also desire to go to bed early and i also desire these things and then when you take a step back outside and you leave all the emotions you know away from you you can look at it logically and you can say well, I, I do want the salad and I want the, the feeling that I get when I eat the salad and I want um, to feel proud of myself and I want to feel energetic and I want to feel all these things that you feel when you get the salad. And then you, you, you're more likely to gravitate towards that because you want those things instead of feeling shameful and mm -hmm. regretful and all of those things because it's not about restriction, it's about giving yourself back the power because you get to choose how your life goes. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I kind of applied those principles early on. Um, I also, uh, not that I've learned this in the book, but focusing one day at a time, one task at a time, you one know, meal at a time. You were yeah. speaking, this was something that was like going on in my mind. I was like, I have so many wants. You know, I want so many things. Like I want the door to be painted. I want the walls to be painted. I want the house to be clean. I want to go to our horses. I want this, 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 you know? And I'm like, yeah, it becomes so challenging. It seems like it's too much. And then what you say, focus at one day at a time. Like what can you accomplish in, what can you accomplish today? Like yeah. even like make a list. And if you can think from that list, I did this today. It, you, like, you know, if you only keep it in your head, it feels like I did nothing. Yeah. It feels like, okay, I, I wanted to do this, but I didn't do it. But actually, actually, when you write it down and you see, I wanted to do this and I actually did it, 
it's like wow i can really do what i want to do and they're just so empowering so you always have been saying focus on one day at a time <laughs> it's just amazing yeah do you still do that even after 10 years yeah. do you still apply the rule uh, not every day because now it's habit it's pretty easy but i mean now, it adds, you know things in your life you know when you yeah. start something new you know yeah. like let's say you are moving to a new place and it's also overwhelming right you have to arrange so many things but you can only do this much in one day right mm, exactly yes i definitely use that very often and actually um since nate went to oregon i kind of made a like a little challenge with myself i've been going for walks every day and in instead of thinking oh i'm gonna go on a walk every day for the rest of the year mm -hmm. That feels really overwhelming, mm -hmm. right? All I think is, all I have to do is go on a walk today. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. I just have to focus on the task today. And that's it. It, it, it takes away a lot of the overwhelm that people might feel, especially when they're like, oh, I have to be super perfect raw vegan mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. and. And then some people actually get anxiety mm -hmm. when they tell themselves that they will never have pasta again, or they'll never have bread again, or they'll never. The word never is very, like psychologically, we can't grasp truly what the word never means. Mm -hmm. And we use a lot, a lot in our language, but it's, it's like, it's abstract. Like we can't know what never means necessarily so when we say never it's such a an absolute term and a lot of people feel anxiety when it comes to that giving up certain foods or what have mm -hmm. you and something that really helped me a lot is using my procrastination skills to my advantage by procrastinating on the habits that i no longer want to be doing so for example if I no longer want to be eating bread, we'll just use this as an example. And I say, uh, instead of saying, I never will eat bread ever again, today, today I'm going to eat raw. Instead, you focus on the other thing. But instead of saying never, say, I'll have it another time, some other time. And some other time might become never, right? Mm -hmm. But the some <laughs> other time, yeah. It, it, it frees you from the chains of never and the pressure yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Of life. so that really helped too mm -hmm. that really helped too by just procrastinating on the stuff that i you know like if i want to go to bed late i'm like i'll do that another day but tonight i'm going to bed <laughs> right that's for example <laughs> That's really nice. And so, um, can you share a little bit more about the book? Like, you know, what uh, has been for you? Like, I mean, you read it twice now, so it must be really, really, really interesting to revisit the same thing. Because when I was doing my PhD, I also had it with scientific papers. Like, I would read something, and I thought, no, you know, this doesn't have much in it that I can use. And then, like, after two years, I would go back to it. I was like, wow, it has so much in it. How couldn't I not see it the first time? So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, after you read it twice, is there something that stands out, you know, like that he really thinks like when you want to practice self-discipline, this is really, these are the pillars. Mm -hmm. Because you also, yeah. also mentioned, you also mentioned that the title is mindful. And I love that, mindful self-discipline. Because mindless self-discipline can be very detrimental. Yes. In the yes. movement especially. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. I totally agree with you. Um, and the reason why I wanted to read it again is completely because I love the language that he uses in the book. Um, you know, there's like random things that I kind of like cringe at, but you know, not, not everybody has, you know, everything that you might agree with. Like, you know, he gives a plus one for doing certain things that I personally wouldn't do, mm -hmm. but regardless of that, I really love how he talks about discipline, being mindful mm -hmm. instead of being restricted. Exactly. And so many people think that being disciplined is restrictive, that they're not able to do this and they're not able to do that and they can't eat this and blah, blah, blah. But that's not what it is. When you're mindful, mm -hmm. you're actually choosing things that are going to take you to another level in mm -hmm. your life. Mm -hmm. And even though they might be discomfort like it might be uncomfortable right now to do these things right like working out 
it's not fun. <laughs> I mean, some people think it is, but yeah. you know, like we have a lot of struggle with that kind of thing. And eating a salad with a whole party of people who are eating junk food can be challenging and uncomfortable. Um, breath work can be challenging and uncomfortable. Running on the treadmill for cardio is challenging and uncomfortable. Cold showers are challenging and uncomfortable. Meditation is challenging and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But these kinds of things help us grow. So when we put ourselves in that space where we challenge our willpower, when we challenge our you know, choices and things like that, it actually helps us grow and that's why things become easier. Not only do they become habits, but we get used to making those choices and they just get easier and easier with time. But I love that he's, he talks about it being mindful as in you are the one who's in control of your choices. Your choices aren't in control of you because when you say something like, I can't have pizza, the pizza's in control of you. But when you say, I choose to have a raw salad, you are in control mm -hmm. of it and you're making a different choice. I also love in the book how he doesn't put any um, labels on choices. They're all just choices, mm -hmm. right? They're not like a good choice or a bad choice. I mean, he does talk about that later, but he doesn't say the choice is bad. He says that the choice takes you either away from your goal or towards your goal. So if you, even if you choose something that's off your goal, mm -hmm. it's not that you're a bad person. And I think a lot of people identify too much mm -hmm. with um, their choices. Mm -hmm. And when they make a bad choice, suddenly they're a bad person. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's a, Choices are just choices. They're neutral. It's just some choices take you towards your goals and some choices take you away from them. And it's all up to you which goals you have in your life and where you want to go. And, and then you determine your choices based on that. So it doesn't make you a bad person. And that's something that I see so much. People mm -hmm. get so worked up and frustrated and, and they kick themselves and that just causes more stress, which, you know, isn't, isn't ideal either. So I, yeah, that's one thing that I really like about that book. And just like the future self thing was another aha thing that I didn't really realize the first time I read it. But thinking of our future selves and Nate and I over the last year or so since we released the rap book, we like to have our wraps the next day. But in order to do that, we have to make them the night before when we don't want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're human too. We don't always want to make food. But um, thinking of our future selves has really been a game changer in our lives as well, because when we don't feel like it, we think, you know, tomorrow, Lissa and Nate are going to be really happy that the wraps are done if we do them now, even though it only takes 15 minutes, right? So we're like, just get up. And, you know, sometimes just getting up and going in the kitchen starts that action because action comes before motivation. You know, always motivated to do stuff. But, you know, if you get up and go in the kitchen, you know, you grab the blender or whatever, you're like, well, I'm in here now, might as well make it, <laughs> right? So that can be really helpful. But that's another thing that I learned from the book um, that I've noticed we've been naturally implementing into our lives anyways, is thinking of our future self. And I want to take care of my future self. I, I find that a lot of people take care of everyone else in their life. And they put, you know, mm -hmm. their kids first and their husband first or their spouse or their wife or whatever. Yeah. No, the you boss. Don't, don't even need to have kids. I mean, yeah. Well, I unfortunately belong to that category of people. We just really feel responsible for anything else. Yeah. And we us. Mm -hmm. I think we, I somehow think that we develop this tendency during childhood, you know, like I, I pro probably did get it from childhood because I always felt responsible for my mom. Yeah. And, you know, I brought it, I just, it just brought it with me into my marriage. And like, mm. I, I even, you know, make my dog more important than myself. It's like crazy. He needs to go out. He needs to have fresh water. And so for me, thinking about self-discipline is not only to push myself, you know, or seeing my future self accomplishing things. But for me, is also seeing that I actually need to pull back, that I have to stop doing so much for everybody else. And like you said, that I have to really turn attention to myself and see who I want to be tomorrow. Yeah. If I keep on doing 
all these things and continuously focus on other people, I just burn out. Mm -hmm. And then my future self next day is very <laughs> I know, I know, right? As, yeah, so like I think a lot because a lot of people don't identify with their future selves, I like to say, um, I've told this to quite a few people and it's really been helpful for them. I tell them to think of their future self as their middle name. So my middle name is Eileen. So Eileen is gonna need lunch tomorrow and Eileen is going to want to meet up for you with you for a walk tomorrow and Eileen um, wants you to read the book with her and Eileen wants these things, right? So when I think of the, the person that I need to show up for, it helps a lot because then I can more identify with, you know, mm -hmm. someone else. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, Eileen wants to go for a walk tomorrow at 10 a.m. So I'm going to show up for her and I'm going to go on a walk with her because you're, you're just going for a walk with yourself, right? Yeah. Or if you think like Eileen needs lunch tomorrow, so I have to make lunch because we're so good at doing things for other people. Mm -hmm. We might as well put ourselves in that basket too. Right? Exactly. <laughs> You know, sometimes it's also interesting that I find that it's more tiresome to actually think about what I don't, what I should do, but I'm actually not doing than to just get up and think, right? Like thinking about it is so tiring. It's like crazy. And like you said about preparing those grabs, okay, you get up, you drop it in the blender. It takes like 15 minutes and then your mind is clear, you know, you don't have to carry that the baggage of I should have made it. And the next day you are, yeah, if I only have done it, I would feel so much better, right? And it just really costs no time. So it's just really worth it to, you know, think less and do more, right? Yes, exactly. No, totally agree. Yeah, we really got to think more about ourselves. And some people have told me like, well, it's selfish to think more about myself. And I'm like, well, actually it's selfless because when you think about yourself and you feel yourself and you take care of yourself, you can better take care of your kids and your spouse and your coworkers and your job and your mm -hmm. clients and all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? So it's actually selfless mm -hmm. to take care of yourself because you could be of better service to others. So <laughs> it's another perspective shift. Do you think that this is something that was so commonly used, you know, when we were growing up, like in 80s, because, you know, I heard it all the time. You are selfish. You have to first think about others. You have to share. You have to let this uh, girl go on the swing because, well, she's waiting there. Instead of, you know, telling me, oh, you can just enjoy your time. And the girl, you just tell her and she can come in five minutes and you are both happy instead of she's standing there totally frustrated and you're feeling, oh, I shouldn't be having fun because I'm making someone else unhappy, right? Yeah. It's like, I don't know, like when we were growing up, I feel that this was really such a predominant uh, thing, which I heard really often. Mm -hmm. I heard it often too, totally. Yeah, you're being selfish. Um, yeah, you got to think about others. And then, and then when it comes into the adulthood and you've got jobs, right? You, you have to show up for the time, right? You have to stay late for certain things. You need to please your boss. And then mm -hmm. if you want to get a raise, you got to do all these things. And, and then I feel like society itself has grown accustomed to this. And whenever we do something for ourselves, you know, people think that it's, it's selfish or what have you, or that we shouldn't have the things that we do or buy the things that we do because maybe they don't have it mm -hmm. and they feel it's selfish. Mm -hmm. So it, it's challenging because I've really had to, over the years, release like the guilt that I have about being successful, which is oh. pretty sad. Because oh, Lisa, I know, I know. It's a really hard one. Yeah. You know, like it's that's probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes it feels, yeah, it feels like you should be, you should have shame about yourself because you are achieving and others are not. Mm -hmm. and, and, and plus people usually don't realize that achieving something takes a lot of work. It's like, it doesn't just drop from the sky, right? Like, it takes so much self-discipline that we are talking about. Like, you know, me doing the PhD with four times being pregnant. You know, it's like, yeah, you did PhD and you had four children and a miracle. How did you do it? Nobody knows what was behind, you know? It was yeah. like so, so tough. And 
and everything but but i think it's just so nice if we have a goal mm -hmm. that we are just willing to go for it and we know that we need to make sacrifices and we know that it's not going to be just walk uh, on the pink clouds it's mm -hmm. just it's part of the deal we are going to have hard times yeah and those hard times are going to make us stronger exactly. that's the beauty thing to realize Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And again, he, in the book, he talks about that too. I'm glad you brought it up. He talks about enjoying the journey. And I saw a reel um, earlier today where the person was saying, when you go on a hike, yeah, you're going to go to the top. That's your goal, right? To the top of the mountain. But if you're constantly like, oh, we got to like hike up. It's, there's so much more to go and it's tiring and all this. Like you miss the whole point of going on the hike. <laughs> going on the hike was to enjoy the journey up to the top mm -hmm. and then enjoy the top. So instead of just solely focusing on your goal, enjoy the journey. Like today is your journey is right now. Today we're alive right now and we're having this conversation mm -hmm. and today is our day to practice who we want to become and to enjoy that practice. And I love that he talks about that too in the book is like in learning to enjoy your daily discipline and enjoy the things that you are choosing to do. Like you're choosing to make a salad. So enjoy that choice because it's what you really wanted. So I know. yeah, I like that, but I, it's hard. I relate <laughs> To this and immediately I'm thinking how to translate this in you know like making lifestyle choices and changes and so like if you decide to follow some meal plan and you know you find meals that you don't like at all I mean it's clear red flag that something is wrong with that plan because if you go on a plan you should definitely be enjoying it. And of course, sometimes you start to eat more raw vegetables and that fiber, you know, it takes time to get used to it. So of course, of course, there is this, um, there is this fine line between, you know, like, does it taste great or do I need some time to adjust? But sometimes some meals are just really red flag. Like it really doesn't taste good. Like your body really doesn't mm -hmm. want it. So should you be pushing yourself or should you be enjoying yourself, you know? And I think that sometimes just for the sake of belonging, for the same of, for the sake of approval, people are willing to do, you know? Mm -hmm. People are willing to really do plans that are, in the end of the day, not really benefiting them. So I really like that you say that it's important to, to enjoy what we are doing at that very moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can shift our mindset too. I, I love that you brought that up because it's true. You know, like you gotta follow your intuition too and you know, the science and obviously, right? But when people ask me, they're like, well, you know, isn't raw boring? I find so much joy in the process. I, I find joy being in the kitchen. I used to hate going in the kitchen and making food. And you know, there's, I have my days, there's days where I don't want to make food, but I do it anyway. Right. <laughs> um, but that's, that's where the self-discipline comes into play. I pause. He has a method called paw. It's pause, awareness, and willpower. Mm -hmm. So first you pause, you, you take a breath and you really like take a step back and take yourself out of the emotions and really just pause and breathe and calm down. <laughs> and then you practice awareness. So you become aware of all the possible choices that are in front of you. You also become aware of what you're feeling inside and the thoughts you're having. Are you feeling guilty? Are you feeling happy? Are you feeling resentful? Are you feeling you know, what, what are you feeling? And just, you know, let those emotions exist. And then you choose the, the choice that most aligns with your goal. And then that's when you use willpower to just do the thing, <laughs> you know, just, just do it. Because a lot of times when you just do it, you feel so good after you're like, I'm so glad I did it. <laughs> so yeah. that's something that I do a lot when I'm not feeling like doing something. And this happens a lot with me because I'm a creative and I don't mix well. It's like oil and water with paperwork. I can't stand paperwork. Mm -hmm. I can't stand having to do all that, like taxes. And mm -hmm. even like Nate and I, um, we just bought a new place. We're moving in June. And 
just all the paperwork and all the things you need to collect my immigration gave me such anxiety like making mm -hmm. sure i have everything for the government and mm -hmm. you know this, like this kind of stuff gives me anxiety mm -hmm. so whenever i get an email from my accountant or whatever all of a sudden i feel anxiety mm -hmm. because i got to collect something and make sure that i get it right because i don't want to do it wrong mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know like i feel these things um and when i get in the those states and it's it's improved a lot over the years because I continually practice this whenever mm -hmm. I feel anxious I think to my I, t I pause I take a step back and I practice awareness and I'm like I'm feeling anxious over this but I know that if I just do the thing it's gonna be easy and I'm gonna send it off and I'm gonna feel amazing mm -hmm. but if I ignore the email and I keep thinking about it it's just going to get worse mm -hmm. and I'm going to put it off. So it's like, just do the thing. You're going to feel good after. And I apply that to so many things in my life as well. Like going for a walk. If I don't feel like going for a walk, sometimes it's like, just go for five minutes. Yeah. You know, you know, and then once I start walking, I'm like, well, I might as well do the whole half an hour. <laughs> right? exactly. So exactly. yeah. So sometimes just doing the thing can make us feel so much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes wonder, you know, like I, I have these uh, moments when I'm really into sports and I really love exercising. Like it just makes me feel so good. But then every winter there is this moment. I think it's some, maybe it has to do something with the daylight because I love to go running in the morning, you know, and in winter it's just so dark. And then I go in the park and I have to wear this uh, chest torch so I can see at all because it's like so, 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 so dark. And then there is this moment when I drop it and, you know, then I start to feel like my body feels differently and then it takes so long to to encourage myself like yeah you should be starting but now now you didn't run for three months it will be difficult you know and then the funny thing is that the moment i go my body remembers yeah you know it body just remembers and body adjusts to the phase that you can take that you can just maintain which is actually not difficult and then the interesting thing is also that then i go for like 10 runs and suddenly I see that without any effort, I'm running long, I'm running more kilometers in the same amount of time without realizing it. Oh. You know, like that the body just picks up the speed and I totally don't feel like it costs me some effort or anything. And with food is the same. Mm -hmm. Like if you start with fruit in the morning, it just becomes so easy because when you go to it, anything else, it just feels like, I don't know. It, <laughs> right like i cannot imagine to go to eat anything else than fruit in the morning like okay in some occasion overnight oats okay if i'm skiing and there is nothing else you know i'll yeah. do that but uh whenever i have the option it it doesn't take any effort it's just it's so natural right it just becomes such a natural habit that uh we're just doing it mm -hmm. Yeah, we just have to do it. And yeah, that's when people ask me too. That's another thing um, I'm glad we're chatting about is people often ask like, well, how long will it take? Uh -huh. Like they want, they want a time frame. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you know, it's not about how long it'll take. It's about how many repetitions you do. Because mm -hmm. you can have person A wanting to go raw, for example. And then you have person B who wants to go raw as well. But person A, you know, chooses two raw meals a day for three months. And then person B only chooses one meal a day every couple of days. And they're, and they're trying, they're still trying, which is great. But the person who's choosing two a day over three months, it's going to be more of a daily habit and a lot easier for them to choose raw than it is for person B who's only choosing it once in a while. Because it's about the repetitions. The more often we repeat a habit, the easier it gets. And, and it goes for good or, you know, I don't, I don't like using labels, but it goes for, you know, the habits that take us to our goals or the habits that take us away from our goals. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. A habit doesn't care because mm -hmm. it's just going to get stronger the more you do it. <laughs> and do you, do you, you know, do you sometimes, uh, like I talk about running, do you have it with something else, you know, that you also feel like... Uh 
oh, now I really would like to be doing this, but it just seems like difficult. And then how do you overcome those, you know, those oh. feelings of it's so difficult. I've been doing the reps, that's easy because you get up and it takes you 15 minutes. But, you know, some habits take a little bit more commitment than just 15 minutes of a blending. So how do you deal with these uh, periods of time? Because I'm sure all of us have those periods that we feel like, you know, just it's too much, it's too much. Uh, would like to just you know take it easy but it seems like i can never take it easy so how do you how do you cruise through those times yeah that's that's good um one thing that for me has always been a challenge for me um and i shouldn't say that because you speak your reality um but uh i find that going for my walks has been harder um to be consistent with that because i I, I work like 10 to 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So most days and people don't realize that they don't, they don't realize how much work goes into social media unless you do uh, social media. When I see what you produce, I, 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 I admire you. It's like, it's incredible. You know, Thank it's you. incredible. And, and people, I would like to point here out also that making the raw vegan bundle, people just have no idea how much work that is and what a good deal it is to buy. It. Yeah. Yes, if, agreed. If, well, you know, I'm economist. If you should count all the external externalities, which are not accounted in the price, it wouldn't cost fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. It's very cheap. For yeah, the amount of work that you and Chris put in it, plus everybody who contributed, you know, and all these free talks we are doing and everything, it's like incredible. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's just incredible. People, there are only three days left, so really take the chance, right? It's a yes, link, go, go visit um, Susanna and get the link in her bio or you can get it from mine, but go grab the bundle because yes, there's only three days left. Um, it's ending Sunday. So yeah, go get it, go get it. But yeah, on that note, it's like, even with the bundle, um, I've been, I, like I said, I made this like commitment to myself that I wanted to go walking every morning. And it's most of the time, like even when Nate's here, like in the morning we want to go for the walk, but you know, I'm tired and I want to lay in bed and I don't want to get up right away. And I'm kind of one of those slow morning people. Mm -hmm. Like I like to wake up and then lay in bed for like a half an hour or more. No, I do. <laughs> right. Like I always yeah. wake up on earlier just to have that extra hour. <laughs> right. right. And, and you know, Nate will make me an early smoothie. So I have my breakfast and, um, but, like, I don't always want to just get up. Like, Nate's different. He can just get up and go for a run. Like, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> but I can't do that. So for me, it's challenging to, like, get up and go. But I really made this commitment to myself. And I said, all I need to do, and this is how I get over that kind of stuff, is just do five minutes or just pick up the knife. And I remember early in my journey, when I first started raw, I would sometimes be really hungry in the morning and want to like eat all kinds of things because you're dealing with past habits mm -hmm. and you're like trying to fight those mm -hmm. older habits. And I wouldn't want fruit. I would want something salty and savory or whatever. All I would tell myself is go in the kitchen and pick up the orange. That's all you need to do. You don't need to peel it. You don't need to cut it. You don't need to eat it yet. Like just pick up the orange. That's all you need to do. So I would go and I'd pick up the orange and I'd be looking at it and then I would smell it. And then suddenly just the action of doing that would start to stir up motivation for me to do it. So in the book, he says the same thing. He's like, if you want to be a writer, don't think about writing 500 words. Think about writing one sentence. If you want to be a runner, don't think about running 10 miles. Think about running one mm -hmm. or even just half right? Like start with small increments, because if you can do that, then you're likely to do a lot more after because you're already doing it. It's like, why would you just do one minute of running when you know, you're already running, you might as well keep going, right? So that's what really helps me when I'm not feeling like doing the thing, mm -hmm. or I want to get back into something. I just say, okay, just just do one minute of it. Mm -hmm. And, and likely, I'm more likely to want to get into it like especially like I haven't 
been making too many YouTube videos recently because like Nate's parents passed away and you know, there was problems with our truck and our storage unit was broken into and now we're buying this new place and the bundles, like I would organize two bundles this year and it's just like, there's so much going on mm -hmm. that I haven't been able to make a lot of YouTube videos. And now whenever I think of doing a YouTube video, I feel really overwhelmed because they are a lot of work. They're like people, again, no. people don't realize how much work. Because, um, like these, what I eat in a day videos that I've been posting. I just posted, um, one this morning. It, they take like, even though they're like a four to seven minute video, they take like five or six hours to make. They're not like an easy, just throw together thing. And a lot of reels that I post can sometimes take an hour and a half to make. Yeah. So yeah, you, a a lot of time goes into creating these. So when I think about making YouTube videos, I used to be so good at them. I would do them every single week and I'd be good to go, you know, but since I haven't made them, like you said, with your running, <laughs> mm -hmm. if you stop, right? You, you're like, oh, it's like overwhelming. To right. Make a, a, <laughs> right. But um, what I've noticed is, again, I use the same principle. I'm like, just edit for five minutes. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like, you don't have have to do the whole video right now just, just start editing just for five minutes and then you can do whatever but then when i start doing the five minutes i get into it and i'm like okay you know I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. and then suddenly 45 minutes goes by and i feel accomplished I'm like okay this isn't as hard as it is bad like i thought it was actually i'm quite good at it because i used to be good at it and my i just remember how to do it right yeah. the, 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 yeah. the doesn't go away i saw here that somebody wrote very very long a question so let's go back to that yeah um oh somebody's asking what's the bundle social media or raw good raw, uh, raw food coaching oh too much raw food caused me intestinal distress with gas and bloating i had to do it a little at a time i still need some good uh lightly steamed uh i don't know probably vegetables or something so um yeah that was the question um so we already explained what's the bundle or maybe you want to uh, repeat one more time what is included in the bundle yeah for sure so the bundle is a collection of ebooks and courses and 33 items have been contributed to this bundle. So basically you pay $50 and then you get an email with a link to download all 33 things and everything in this bundle is absolutely brand new. No one has anything that's in this bundle. It's all new and it's all raw and you're getting over $840 worth of brand new content from all of us. But we can only run it for, you know, this bundle is 13 days, but it ends on Sunday. So there's only like two and a half days left to get it. Uh, but once it's over, you can no longer buy all of this stuff together for $50. You have to buy everything separately and it would cost over $840 to buy everything that we've contributed to it. Nate and I contributed our raw vegan travel ebook. So this is how we travel, how we hike, how we camp, how we air travel, how we do raw at resorts, how we, how we do it, then, how we do it in travel and adventure. So impressive. And people don't realize when you mentioned that it's about traveling that actually has hundred recipes. Yes. Yep. Impressive. You know, I was <laughs> blown away. I expected that it will be story, you know, and then I found out that there are actually hundred <laughs> recipes in the book, which is incredible. And all these oh. So beautiful views to you eating somewhere high in the mountains or, or camping or stuff like that just really really wonderful and and i think that you have also a lot to say about too much raw food cause me intestinal distress because you are the gut microbiome expert i dare to say so would you like to address that yes i would um so yeah uh, thank you for that um I, yeah i'm definitely a gut nerd for sure um, but what i've learned over the last four years really diving into the research of the gut microbiome is that if raw food causes you digestive upset or even cooked plants or any of that, because of the higher fiber amount, it's basically feeding your microbiome and your microbiome is growing. And this can cause discomfort, gas, bloating if you're overdoing it. So usually most people, they go from either a standard North American diet or they're eating, you know, a lot of animal products which have zero fiber or oils, you know, processed food which is super low fiber. And then they move over to a raw diet or a whole food plant-based diet and suddenly they're eating like 30, 40, 50 grams of fiber a day 
which they're all, you know, maybe they're used to only eating five to 10 grams, mm -hmm. which is the average. And their gut is like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like it's, it's too much for them. They're not strong enough. They're not, they, you know, you don't have a big enough colony. So if somebody has issues with digesting raw foods, it's not the raw foods fault. It's just that your gut needs a little bit of TLC. It's like going to the gym. If you go to the gym and you start trying to lift the 80 pound weights and you know, like you can hurt yourself, yes. right? It's not gonna feel good the next day. So you go and you start with the five pounds. And then, you know, after a week or two of consistency, then you move up to the 10 pounds. And as your muscles grow, you can lift more weight. So the same goes with our microbiome. As you introduce small amounts of these fibers into your diet, your gut grows, and then you can enjoy more of those fibers and your gut just grows based on that. So it's something that's not black and white. Like I know a lot of people want to go all raw and be, you know, hundred percent perfect and all this kind of stuff, which I don't think works for most people. Mm -hmm. Some people can do it. And if you have enough willpower and you have enough desire and you don't care about feeling uncomfortable for a little bit, some people can do it. But for the average person, I think it's more ideal, like just, just go vegan first. Yeah. Right. And then you you know? start incorporating small mm -hmm. amounts of raw mm -hmm. until you feel comfortable and then in include more. And it's a journey. Like, like we said, like we're looking at the top of the mountain. Whereas like you have a long way to get there. <laughs> so, and you know, I'm thinking like sometimes people also who start with raw food, they don't realize that, you know, it sounds easy. Just go and eat raw food, but actually it's not that easy because if you are insulin resistant, if you don't understand the concept of calorie density, mm -hmm. you know, and if you only eat vegetables, but you are not eating enough calories, I guarantee you, you are going to feel very uncomfortable in your stomach because you make your body work over time processing all that fiber while you actually don't deliver any calories so you are really straining your system so i think that you know to do this overnight would require in my opinion have a coach every day you know somebody really experienced who is really going to tell you like this is what you are going to eat for breakfast given your personal situation because you cannot just assume that it, there is this approach which is going to fit to everyone because some of us have extra weight some of us maybe need to gain weight you know um we have different uh, state of nourishment i like to say mm -hmm. and depending on our current state of nourishment we are going to uh take certain steps which are really not going to be the same for everybody so so uh yeah take taking it Oh, like you said, and even even accept that uh, cooked food is part of this transition. It's totally fine. It's it's okay. Cooked food is not a bad thing if you choose the right cooked food. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I know. And that's another thing. Like people get so scared of cooked food because there's influencers out there who say it's toxic or poisonous or what have you. But like you said, choose the one that works best with where you're at and choose the cooking method that is, you know, the least damaging to the food or whatever you want to do, but not to do it because you feel guilty or regretful or anything about like having the cooked food. Mm -hmm. Choose, choose the cooked food because it works for you at this time in your life and choose raw because you want raw, right? That's how I view it. And that's how I viewed it for years and years and years is that, People say like, well, you know, like cooked food is toxic. Like, is that why you don't eat it? And I'm like, no, I don't eat it because I prefer raw. Mm -hmm. I just, I just want to eat raw food. So why not eat what I want to eat? And it's so much more freeing than to think of it as like, I'm doing raw because I'm scared of cooking. Exactly. Right? It's not yeah. informed because you need to try it for yourself in order to be able to make choice mm -hmm. and only if you know how these two different approaches make you feel, you can decide, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, there's some people who go in and out and it's sad to me when I, you know, when there's people online who maybe like, you know, start adding cooked food back after being raw for a while or what have you, and they get judged so harshly online. Like, 
it's really sad because it's like, maybe they just want that. Like, it doesn't mean that raw food is not good, right? It just means that they, they just wanted something different. Yeah. So like, you know, why are we judging people so hard? It's, it's not helpful at all. And you know, I even don't like to judge people who go back to uh, animal foods mm. because you know why I tell you this, when somebody does raw food diet in a very imbalanced way and they're missing a lot of nutrients, and if they are not able to get reliable, you know, source of information and to improve their diet, I think it's better for them. It's better for their health to eat animal food diet than to eat really poorly, you know, created raw food plan that over a longer period of time uh, can just harm them. Because really, if we don't eat enough calories, if we don't understand that we need to get a wide spectrum of nutrients, that we don't understand we need to eat a large volume of food, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. And we need to invest the time to prepare it. So, I know. so to just Yeah, it's very, <clears throat> it's very interesting yeah. to see the patterns. Yeah. The patterns that happen with people who do go back to eating animal products. And it's almost the same thing, almost, because we don't, we don't use absolutes, but it's very, very, very likely that they were under eating, that they were over detoxing, that they were going on super long juice fast. And I know or they only eat fruit. Yeah, or, or they only eat fruit. You know, yeah. like large quantities of fruit, fruitarians. That, that's what my observation is. Like, you know, hardly any vegetables, like a lot of fruit juices, a lot of sweet fruit. And uh, I think that vegetables for me personally, I can't imagine my life without vegetables. Yeah. It's like, I, I couldn't be fruitarian. It's, it's for me, I love fruit. Like, I love it really much, but to be fruitarian, I, I don't think I could, I could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel it's very imbalanced. Um, and you know, people will disagree and they'll say, no, fruit is the only food that we should be eating. But it's, it's like very restrictive in the way, like we're missing out on so much that from the vegetable kingdom because we're putting fruit on this pedestal mm -hmm. of being the only thing, right? And I feel like society has this obsession with the one thing, the one thing, the one thing that, you know, will be the only thing that you'll ever need, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, but life isn't like that. No, we need a wide variety of stuff. We, like you can't just rely on community for health if you're eating junk food and laying on the couch all day. But you can't only rely on sunshine and nature for health if you're not going to bed early and you're not exercising. Mm -hmm. You can't only rely on diet mm -hmm. if you have a stressful job and you have horrible relationships <laughs> or you don't have your spirituality. Like you know, it comes into play, just like all areas of our life need to be biodiverse. Exactly. All areas of our diet need to be biodiverse as well. And I like to use the analogy, we don't want to monocrop our guts with very limited amount of foods. We want a big jungle with, you know, like thousands of species of life. Like we, we value biodiversity in our jungles, but we don't value biodiversity in our diets or our guts. So it's like, we don't want to monocrop our guts. We want to make sure that we give them a huge variety. So that way we get a good range of nutrition. We get a good range of fiber to feed our microbiome and we get a good range of flavors. It's enjoyable. We like that, right? Like, of course I'll love, like if I've got some good mangoes or nectarines, I'll eat a bunch of good mangoes and nectarines, but that's not all I eat all day. Like I have, you know, salads with like 25 things in them and, and people get scared of that because of this diet minimalism mm -hmm. process that we can we only need the one thing just the one thing is all we need and if it doesn't cover all our goals it's not you know we shouldn't be eating it or something but it's like no it's a combination of everything that all comes together to create our health just like all the other areas of health exercise and sleep and meditation and all that we have to give all of that equal value as well same with variety in our diet you know but i like to also add that i'm agricultural economist by training and you know the longer i do this the more i realize that if we diversify our diet so meaning we are not going to you know the, the four crops that are grown globally like the you know 
and also oftentimes uh, grown with a genetic modification. I mean, it's wheat, it's rice, then oil seed rate, and the last one I, I can't remember, but you know, there are four, corn, corn. So corn, there yeah. are, and you know, these are like four huge monocultures. Mm -hmm. And so if we actually diversify our diet, we are diversifying our agriculture. Isn't that like amazing? And then if you realize that two of these crops, uh, I didn't mention soybean, so soybean and maize are basically mostly grown to feed the agricultural animals. You know, so if we, and if somebody tells me, oh, but if everybody would go plant-based, we couldn't produce, you know, the amount of plant foods. And I'm like, just imagine how much water is fed to these animals and how, you know, like it's totally an inefficient way of food production if you really think about it. So mm -hmm. if we create diversity on our plate, like me individual, I decide to eat, you know, diversity in my diet, I'm actually making such a huge impact on the whole planet. It's just incredible, you know, such a simple solution. If everybody would wake up to this, this world would be different place. Isn't it just mind blowing? I, you know, every time I think about it, it's like, wow, everything is so connected. Mm -hmm. I know, I love that concept. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, the way the world is, I mean, when it boils down to it, it's the dollars that go into it, right? And, and the dollars that go into it are, you know, lobbied and, you know, things come into play to solidify it, but we pay for it. Mm -hmm. We pay for it. We paid, like, I, I mean, I live in Las Vegas and in Las Vegas, has the highest percentage of fast food restaurants of any city in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we have more fast food restaurants here in the city than anywhere else in the United States. And people pay for it. That's why they exist. They wouldn't exist if we didn't pay for it. Because mm -hmm. when we pay for it, then they use that money to lobby the government to get, you know, and then the animal industry uses the money that we pay to pay for these products, to lobby and get, you know, certain laws in place or whatever they're going to do. But it's our dollars that's going mm -hmm. to all of that. Mm -hmm. And once we wake up and realize that our dollars are the ones that have created this world the way it is for the most part, right? Obviously there's big people, there's billionaires out there who are doing their thing, but we speak with our dollars and we can change the world. I believe that we can, if we all just make, different choices and move towards a different way of you know purchasing instead of you know feeding into this and a lot of people will say well you know oh it's, I, I just do it once a month or every friday or i took my kids to blah 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 or whatever and it's like but you multiply that by billions of people that's why it continues right even these like the moderation stuff the moderation is, I believe personally, the word moderation is used, overused as a justification mm -hmm. to continue doing things that we already know we should mm -hmm. be doing, right? So many people use it as a justification. They're like, well, in moderation. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, <laughs> but that's why it continues. It continues because we keep putting dollars in it. So I love that you mentioned that about diversity because if we start paying for radishes and beets and carrots and lettuces and different different kinds of these as well, like not just romaine, right? Let's like adventure into the other ones because these farmers are providing mm -hmm. our produce for us. So we should be supporting them for providing these varieties exactly. instead of so, just buying mm -hmm. the same stuff over and over. So, so basically, you know, it seems to me that what you mentioned about uh, a lot of fast foods in Las Vegas that it really comes back to mindful um, self-discipline mm -hmm. because I guess that people go to those places because it's convenient, you know, like people don't want to, people don't want to invest that time. So just with that, and, and plus, I don't know, I guess that in the United States, it's also cheap to eat out. It's mm -hmm. just like, you know, here in the Netherlands, if I want to go eat out, it's so expensive, especially family of six, you know, financially, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense to eat out here. So most people don't do that. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, it's total opposite, right? Like it's cheaper to go to eat out than to buy, uh, let's say, fresh vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it depends on where you go, for sure. Because like Nate and I, 
um, one day we, we were, and I, I share the story in the Tales from the Tailgate ebook that you can get if you buy the bundle. Uh, one day we were doing some errands and we were going to have lunch at home because we thought we were only going to be out for an hour. Like it wasn't a big deal. So we we're going to come home and have lunch. But we got stuck at the oil change place for like almost two hours past. And we still had a whole bunch of stuff to do and we were hungry. So we're like, okay, well, let's just stop at the grocery store because we have all our tools in our truck so we can make a salad in the parking lot. Um, so we went in there, we got one large head of romaine, we got uh, one avocado, six mangoes, because at the time in the summertime, we could get six mangoes for a dollar. Oh, wow. So we got, yeah, I know, it's crazy. Yeah. Six mangoes, we got a lime um, to use as part of the dressing, we got a couple tomatoes, some cilantro, um, I can't remember what else we got. The recipe is in the ebook. But we made those salads on our tailgate. We had two big, gigantic salads. And for two people, it was around $8. Okay, so that's so, so much. Yeah, but it depends. It depends on what grocery store you go to. Mm -hmm. Because if you go, if we would have bought all of that at Whole Foods, it probably mm -hmm. would have been $25, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it really depends on where you shop. Um, and I was walking by... Uh, like, cause we live like kind of near the strip. So, you know, there's a lots of fast food restaurants around mm -hmm. here. And I was looking at the menu and I just saw like the French fries were like $7 for like <laughs> this little tiny thing of fries. I was like, what? It's so big as it's really expensive. Yeah. But it depends too, because you can go to like McDonald's mm -hmm. and get like three things for a dollar. So it really depends on yeah. where you so stop. Unimaginable. unimaginable. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's incredible to me like it's even saddening to me how how cheap it is in states to yeah to be like this mm -hmm. yeah. i know and it's so acceptable and it's available and it's cheap and it's easy and it's convenient and it tastes good like we are battling all of these mm -hmm. desires mm -hmm. but when it comes that's where we use the paw method we pause we practice awareness we see all the possible options in front of us, not just the fast food ones, but the healthy ones too. And then we choose from there what aligns most with us, with our, with our goals. And we always have to go back to our goals. Like, what is it that you, how do you want to act today? One of the sentences that I love, 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 love in the book, it says, mindful self-discipline doesn't ask you how you feel today. It asks you how you're going to show up for your goals mm -hmm. because we might not always feel about feel like it but if we really want to achieve our goals then we ask ourselves how we're going to show up regardless of how we feel that's a that's really that's really beautiful i'm sorry the dog is barking i think somebody is ringing the bell I didn't know no, that's okay that's okay and to play tennis so i think that he is going to continue barking but i would like to really, uh, you know, like close this interview with you sharing like some take home messages, you know, what would you like people to really take from this uh, talk today? Like some like three, you know, key messages that are important to, to remember about self-discipline. About self-discipline. And I would love if people realize that, again, like we talked about, the key takeaway is it's self-discipline not selfless because when you practice these things and you fuel yourself up you can be of better service to others also take it one day at a time one day at a time one meal at a time one moment at a time and then also practicing the paw method where you pause you become aware and you make a choice without emotion on the negative side like i know he talks about um like you know, using the negative as a pull away from the thing. Like you're like, oh, I'm going to feel like crap if I eat pizza and I'm going to feel horrible, blah, blah, blah. I personally don't like to feel the negatives mm -hmm. because I already know. I already know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, already know. <laughs> I don't need to tell myself those yeah. things. I prefer to focus on the positives of the positive choice mm -hmm. instead of the negatives of the negative choice, right? Because that way I feel more drawn and more attracted to it instead of repulsed and repelled. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing that I'd like to share too, is to focus on the positive actions that you wanna make in your life and focus on the positive outcomes that you're gonna get because you're more likely to be drawn towards that. And yeah, 
take care of yourself because I mean, like we only have this one life and we want to enjoy it, not just struggle through it. So enjoy the journey, enjoy the process, enjoy the, the new choices that you're making and enjoy the self-discipline because it actually is fun when, when you get, when you get into it. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa, it was so, so wonderful talking with you. Really, I, I enjoyed so much. I think I'm going to rewatch this uh, interview to, you know, to, to recap what you all talked about because it was really valuable. Uh, Self-discipline for me, I think that I, I don't know, I think I would be lost if I didn't have it. You know, like every morning I wake up and I have to take care of these five beings. I mean, dog is, uh, I come here as my kid too. And, um, if I didn't have self-discipline, I don't know, you know, where these kids would be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a lot of self-discipline, but then I look at them and I think like, you know, how connected I'm, I'm to them and everything. And then I think it's so worth it. And the same with our food choices, you know, if we are willing to invest that little time, actually it's not that much time. We, we tend to make it bigger than it actually is, right? Totally. And just invest that time and we look in the mirror and we think like, oh, wow, I really look good today. And it's not because I'm wearing a ton of makeup, you know, or expensive clothes or something. It's because I really feel good on the inside. It's just so worth it. Yeah. It's just so worth it. And that's only something that can come from experience. Yeah. Like, you know, you can, you can hear 100 people talking about this, but you have to experience it for yourself. And the experience that you have is the best motivation for practicing that uh, self-discipline, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Aw, you are wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and inviting me on to your live. It's always such a pleasure to chat with yes, you. Yes, it was a pleasure also for me. Thank you, Lisa, so very much. And I hope that we connect uh, soon again. Yes, I do too. Go grab the bundle if you haven't yet. Link is in the bio. <laughs> okay, have a nice right. day. You too. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye everybody.